And so, yeah, so this is the regression of the stories book club. Um, this, the goal here is to get through this big tome. Uh, it's not that big of a tome, but I guess it's well, 500 plus pages is big. And, uh, yeah, so the pace, uh, um, so the idea was, I mean, you've been in book clubs before, Gabby? Yeah. You yeah. have, I know you have. So you, you're familiar with the whole process. Um, I guess um, for anybody watching this on, on later, uh, if you have any questions, maybe just message me or let, and we'll, maybe when you come next time, we'll introduce you. I know Ryan is familiar with this whole process as well. So there's no uh, need to belabor all that. Um, what is your experience with, uh, you've been in several book clubs, Gabby? I know you've been yeah, so right. right. Yeah, so um, currently I'm in four book clubs. This is my fourth one because I have a problem, <laughs> yeah. clearly. But, yeah, me um, too. I got the same but, problem. <laughs> yeah, but here with R4DS, this is my second book club. So I am leading okay. one with a Bayesian uh, book, with the base rules that I know you just finished. Oh, okay. Or, yeah, well, that's very interesting. So that means you're, how far into base rules are you? We're start. We just went through um, chapter seven this week, so it's okay. You know, we're getting there. <laughs> so, so Ryan, Ryan and I just finished that. We were the cohort right before you. Mm -hmm. We just finished Bayes' rules, and I think this book uh, is uh, harmonizes well with that. If they use Stan Arm throughout this whole thing, and that's what they use through. You probably I don't know if you got that far yet, but he'll use Stan Arm, our Stan Arm, a lot in the Bayes' rule book too. So it's all going to be very. Useful, especially since this book doesn't go into that very much. He just uses that as a tool and just, you know, presses on with it just for regression. Uh, but great, good. That's very good. Won't have to worry about uh, that. And, and anyone else watching this, um, that Bayes Rule Book Club is a great way to get started on this stuff as well. Uh, so the pace I'm looking to do is one, in, or should we looking to do is one chapter per week, but as usual with these book clubs, some chapters can be a little bit more onerous than others, and the presenter for that week should, you know, take it upon themselves that they decide they want to split that up to multiple weeks, or because the exercises look particularly interesting, they want to split it up to do the exercises in a, in a second week. Uh, that can be arranged. We should just, just talk it out on the Slack and figure it out from there. Is the way to handle that, I think. I'm not sure I'm not forgetting this something that I wanted to do. Let's see. Oh, I should introduce myself, too. I'm sorry. So, uh, This is like my fourth book club, I think. The Bayes Rules one, I, I led that as well, by the way. So if you have any questions about that, let me know. Um, so I just did the Bayes Rule book club. I did the, we're just finishing up the Introduction to Statistical Learning book club. And I just, I'm just starting right now also the Advanced R and the Probability for Data Science book club. So I'm kind of like overextended a little bit myself as well. But uh, So those are the ones I'm doing. R is not really my first language. Um, by any means, I'm, I come from a background doing Python and C++ and uh, Haskell and Mathematica and things like that. So uh, R is a little strange to me at first. So that's why I did the Advanced R Book Club, because it's intended for people who do know programming and like, oh, this is how R works behind the uh, thing. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that. So my R, you may see me when I'm doing R code during these examples, like, what the heck are you doing there? That looks goofy. That's why. I just have a weird background. <laughs> I'm coming at it sideways, I think, in some ways. Um, let's see. Uh, do, do, do. Let's see what else is there. Um, yeah, so anyway, that's we're going to try to take a break, uh, try to take a meet every week, but we could take breaks for holidays. I think in the schedule right now, the only break we have in there is for the daylight savings madness <laughs> that happens in March again, where we where uh, John likes to stop all the book clubs because otherwise it's, it just doesn't work. I don't, I, I see you're signed up for full 29. I don't have any issue with that. I think that's fine because. It's not really holidays, like the day before the day before holiday. So, but, um, and so I don't see any reason to stop any activity for us during this holiday season because our Thursday book clubs don't fall on any holidays. Yeah. Very close. Although yeah. it may be that um, we won't get all, I mean, many people. right now it's just you and me, but maybe those days we're going to yeah. be just either just the two of us again or just four people or something like that. Yeah. Around well, those we days, can talk about it. What I was thinking, we could probably talk about it again next week as well. And then yeah. when there's more people, we can just decide. I mean, we can always, it's our book club, right? So we can do whatever we want. We can decide to change things on the fly anytime we want to as a group, right? Yeah. And again, and by the way, the one F says this is like our book club, not my book club. I'm just here to facilitate and, and keep things going. And so, yeah. 
If anything you feel needs to be changed or different, anyone or other people watching this, just let me know. So the resources, there's the book website, which has the code samples, uh, has code samples both in a base R, which is kind of the, what the book was originally designed with, but then also there's on that same site. I'm going to post these notes. They're not up there yet, but I'll push them to GitHub later so they will appear on the pinned Slack thing. So you'll be able to click these links and see where they go. But essentially the book website, which you've been to, I'm sure has um, the examples. You, for every example they do, they have the code for it. And they, there's a lot of them are also done by somebody else in Tidyverse. And if you're using Python, for example, there's also Bambi versions of them, all, which is the Bambi Python, Bambi Bayesian library um, that you can use with, with Python. So now on to the book proper. This is book regression of other stories it is a deep, 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 deep dive into regression. The whole book is just on the linear regression. It's uh, so if you've done another uh, if you've done another statistical learning book or class or anything like that, you probably took a you know a shallow dive into regression and then went on to other things and like boosted trees or whatever other type of machine uh, machine learning or statistical learning methods there are. But this whole book is just on regression, which is kind of cool. At first, when I, because I just did the base rule, I just did statistical learning, I'm like, oh, this is going to be kind of review, but it'll help me maybe, you know, fill in some things. No, not already. I can see that this is going to be a much deeper dive. It's going to be well worth going through uh, to get a much deeper understanding of regression and, and the issues with regression and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to start with this first chapter where, as you noted, it's basically conceptual chapter review the challenges of statistical inference in general and then look at some of the key challenges you see with regression and modeling in particular and the chapter concept also a chapter of lists i don't know if you notice this the author likes to say oh there's three lists and there's like four of these and there's like two of these he just he likes the structure of things i like lists too but it's starting to get a little bit too much like oh here's another list <laughs> i love lists so he's just yeah i love that <laughs> So the first list was the three challenges of statistics. There's three, not four, not two, just three. <laughs> but when he says challenges, I think he sometimes means more like these are like things you can ch address, challenges you can address with statistics maybe in some sense, because one of them is generalizing from a sample to a population. Like when you take a survey, it's the most common case, right? You take a survey and uh, you want to generalize from that survey. Well, I've got, you know, quite, I took a poll of, 20 people, how does that generalize the population of the whole state or whatever the, the population you're concerned with? The other challenge is, another challenge is generalizing from a treatment to the control group. And by that, it just simply means this is a standard kind of controlled experiment or maybe uncontrolled, but the experiment we have some kind of treatment, you're trying to assess the effects of it. Um, and you're generalizing that to the control group in the sense that if you, um, you're going to try to figure out like, if I did the same treatment to the people in the control group, what would be the effect there, right? Mm -hmm. And then finally, this third one is generalizing from observed measurements to the underlying constructs of interest. And that I thought was kind of interesting because at first, like, what does he mean by that? And what he seems to mean, from what I can tell, is that you can measure certain things. What you can measure and what you can get data on is not, it's often just a proxy for the thing you really care about. And so you have to, like, make that connection from what you're actually getting data on to what you really care about, which is the underlying construct of interest, like he says. So this book focuses on using regression models to address these challenges. And so I, this is the example he gives, and I just pulled in the example from uh, the website to reproduce these plots. And this is the presidential election example. Just to give a basic example of what a regression looks like, I mean, we've seen regressions before. But he's, I think he's just trying to make sure that we're all on the same page here, right? Regression, we know what it is. It's a method to summarize uh, you know, how the predictions or averages of some outcome varies across a set of predictors. In this case, the outcome is the presidential election uh, incumbent vote, the incumbent vote in a presidential election, and the predictor is the economic growth in that period previous. And a priori, you might expect that if there's good economic growth, it's, growth is going to be better for the incumbent. And that seems to be what we see uh, when we pull in the data, and then we just do uh, a straightforward regression. This is using Stan GLM. And again, this is not something that he teaches you how to use in this chapter, but rather, um, he's, I think we actually don't even get back to doing linear regression proper until like maybe chapter six or something. So there's quite a bit of uh, mm -hmm. other things he wants us to do in the meantime. So 
Anyway, I just plot that to reproduce that plot in the book. And we can see that um, it seems like, yeah, adding, uh, having better growth re results in a better incumbent vote percentage. And I just, you know, print out the coefficients. And then you can see the median model of this line is uh, intercept of 46.3 and a slope of three, meaning that every percent growth gives you 3% improvement in your incumbent uh, vote. So that's the basic example. What This is what aggression is. We, I mean, you're probably familiar with it, I'm familiar with it, but it's just nice to, to see, uh, nice to get a place to um, put a flag in the ground. This is where we're starting from. Mm -hmm. So what's it good for? Well, uh, we can see it's good for prediction. We may be able to predict a future vote give, you know, with uncertainty, which we'll address but uh, later in the book, but you know, given the economic growth, well, how well do we think the incumbent's gonna do? That's a prediction in that case. Exploring associations, that's just kind of the summary aspect of it, right? We can see, oh, certainly improving the economy helps the incumbent get back more votes. That seems to be, not certainly, but I'm saying that seems to be the association we've seen in the data, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing certain, right? <laughs> um, good thing too, because if we're for uncertainty, there'd be no data science jobs. <laughs> Everything would be too easy. <laughs> There'll and be no surprises then the next, Yeah, no surprises, exactly. The next example is extrapolation. Uh, this is when um, you're trying to, again, this is kind of like generalizing from the sample to the population, but often your polls that you did are not going to be representative, uh, perfectly representative of the population as a whole. So you, you know, get additional questions to help adjusting for factors like the example here is party identification. And this is something that will that the book will come back to all the way in chapter 17.1 we'll start to see how to do that extrapolation to the population. And I looked ahead and it looks like it's some kind of restratification, which makes sense, but uh, I have something I've not done so well I've done kind of informally but it'd be nice to see it done formally. And then finally, another good use for regression is casual inference, this is this idea of looking at treatment effects right so over in the election example. Uh, we can imagine looking at the effect of some law like tax cuts as a treatment right and trying to understand how that affects election outcomes and it'd be difficult to do because one four-year period is nothing like another four-year period so you have to do some kind of adjustments right uh, this is just an example from the book of what casual inference might look like uh, for some random made-up data but the idea is that you have some you know the key thing with the casual inference is you have to make sure that the Samples are either randomized by you or somehow balanced by some kind of correction factor, right? And with that, then when you you can directly estimate the effect, the casual effect of the treatment on the outcome. So here's a treatment level. This is just meant to be conceptual, right? You know, going from one to five, and then here's the outcome. It seems like the outcome is increased, whatever that means. This is all you know, simulated data for improved treatment. But again, you have to have this balanced or randomized samples and often you don't so that's the other use for uh, regression that he mentions and that's adjusting for these pre-treatment differences and he gives this example where again this is simulated data you, the true effect in the simulation is 10 right but um, when you refit the data you're now you're fitting there's only two outcomes right good or bad or two groups i mean not two groups uh, treatment or no treatment right there's a, there's a whole continuum of outcomes from 20 to 60, but um, there's two, there's, a, there's basically two predictors. One is the treatment, no treatment predictor, and the other one is the pre-treatment predictor, which is some adjustment we're making to the data, right? And that's what he's showing here. So we're actually regressing on the pre-treatment thing to make an adjustment. I thought that was kind of interesting. So there's two uses. One point of regression is actually to look at the effect. Another use of regression is to correct or um, I guess you would call it control for different other things. Control, right? other I variables. like that. Yeah, I like that better. Yeah, yeah. control. Uh, so and these are these are... examples you're talking about, which yeah. I. Yeah, yeah, go, yeah. Ahead. go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. That's, these are the examples you were talking about, which I thought were really interesting to look at. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just, again, I think it was meant to be conceptual. You're not supposed to read those examples. Oh, now I understand everything about what he was talking about. There's meant to be some examples of challenges you face. For example, this Xbox thing, which I thought was pretty interesting. Oh, here's Ryan now. Hey, hey how's it going, man? Sorry. Hi. How's your, my how's teeth? your teeth? <laughs> pretty much the same as they were before I left, but you know how. <laughs> so is it just the three of us? Yeah, um, there may be others joining 
another time, according to. Uh, All right, well, cool. You said there's more people that said they could make it this time, but it could just be, you know, this is the time of year when. I feel like I've seen Gabby. I've seen. Yeah. I feel like I've seen you on like other other videos. Like you've been on other books, I would imagine, because I feel like I um, saw you on one, or maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Yeah, and she's, uh, she's actually rules. leading Bay's rules yeah. right now. Yeah. Well, she's, oh, she's that must that must be it. She's leading that right now. Sweet. Yeah. So uh, but just real quick, so I'm I'm good to go next week. I never responded to you. Good. So no worries. All right. Do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Since uh, sure, yeah, I'm uh, Ryan on Michael. I'm a, um, I guess you could say I'm sort of like um, I do uh, patient preference work and biostatistics for um, Oracle Health or a subsidiary of Oracle Health. Um, I live in Cleveland, Ohio, and. Um, this is my third uh, book club. I mean, I'm, I'm really stacking them up with Ron these days. We're, uh, we're, <laughs> so we're advanced knocking hard, them man. out one by one. This is yeah. a, so um, yeah, I'm, ex I'm ex obviously I, I've had this book on my shelf for when I, I probably bought it on Amazon the second it became available. And of course I've read none of it. So I, this is, you know, uh, I mean, uh, just because I, I thought I, I love these groups because they are um good uh sort of like way to kind of keep you honest and moving forward with this stuff you know it's, time is is um it's is difficult so you know with it, like for all of us i would imagine so it's good to have you know groups to support each other and kind of move the ball keep moving the ball so that's what i like about it i agree otherwise it's yeah too easy to give up on these books <laughs> How yeah. do you pronounce your last name? I'm sorry. It's a uh, Hannah Michael, just the way it oh, looks. Oh, Hannah Michael. <laughs> I'm just okay. I'm just teasing. No, I was. I was thinking Hannah Mitchell. Yeah, I know. Something. I know. So, that's that's what. We, yeah. Hannah Michael. Oh. It's, it's uh, Bohemian or Czech, so we don't believe in vowels apparently. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I buy a vowel? Yeah. Buy a vowel. yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's me. That's funny. Hannah Michael. Okay. Ron, yours is. Le Leisure? How do you pronounce yours? Leisure. Leisure. Yeah. Leisure. Oh, excuse yeah, me. It's, it's French, French sounding. Kind of yeah. Leisure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sounds good. Leisure. <laughs> A croissant. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, right. So we were just, so I, yeah, it's a good thing you have some familiar with the Bayesian and R and everything else. We have to worry about all that kind of thing and doing these book clubs. So that's good. Anyway, where was I? Ah, so we just kind of just started, Ryan, um, yeah. just kind of breezing through. As I said at the beginning, and I'll repeat for you, is that this is obviously a very conceptual chapter. Did you read, by the way, chapter one? Yeah, I didn't even get a chance to read it. I'm sorry. So I will go, go over it and so I will read you'll, it. When you, go through, when you read it, you'll, you'll see it's a very conceptual chapter. You're not, you know, this is meant to introduce some of the issues and challenges of regression and statistical modeling in general. Um, and this guy, you'll see as you get through, there's just a lot of lists, you know, the three challenges, yeah. the three this and the four this. And <laughs> it's one of those type of book, one of those type of chapters, at least. I don't know if the whole book is like that, but mm -hmm. any event, he gives some examples of challenges from regression that will be addressed later in the book. One of them is estimating public opinion from an internet survey on Xbox. So clearly a public opinion poll of just Xbox players is not a very good sample of a population, but he wants to extrapolate that to the general public. And he says we'll learn how more about how to do that in section 17.1 but apparently there you can also it's a real paper it's a real thing he did he has references and you can see more about it that way but the idea was to use other survey responses to other questions not the public opinion questions to try to readjust to um uh that's the word restratify the data to the general population so that's kind of interesting but you can see like i said that seven section 17.1 that's a long way from now but it's it's uh, interesting to me because I don't know how I've never done that before. And I look forward to to seeing how mm -hmm. that works. Right. The second one he talks about is this educational television program that they exposed exposed <laughs> like the radiation. But no, they treated different classrooms with this educational program or not. And there the challenge was trying to deal with the you know there's still some pre treatment differences between the the classrooms that got the treatment and those that did it and so they're adjusting for those and this is an example they are going to follow up with this actual example in section 19.2 we've been promised for that that's a casual a causal causal effect issue 
which is what the subject of uh, section 1942 or at least perhaps more seems like it also throughout a lot of this book he's very interested in causal inference so i expect that to be a recurring theme or seems to be from reading the first chapter i'm extrapolating from the first chapter <laughs> i mean we should do some corrections but uh yeah the the second the third example is this united nations peacekeeping thing which is really interesting because he takes a look at these uh, different countries and whether or not they were able to keep revolution or civil wars from happening uh, by deploying peacekeeping forces. And so right away, there may be an issue here is like, well, peacekeeping forces might not go to places that are really bad. And so when those places have uh, civil wars, it may not be because the peacekeeping forces didn't go there. It may just because it was a really bad place to begin with. So they do an adjustment for that, a pre-treatment adjustment on the badness score. And I guess it turns out to be the opposite case if the peacekeepers tend to go to the more the more bad places. So it actually improved the uh, the prediction of the that there was a good effect. There was a positive effect of the peacekeeping um, core to going to those countries. And then he gives a fourth example, it's kind of a counterexample of the the study of gun laws that he looked at. And the challenge there was that they were applying a regression to 30 predictors with only 50 data points, 50 states. And he says that that, you know, that study just was faulty because there's just too many systematic differences that are not captured by any of the model's predictors. And so I thought that was interesting that this is a gun law study, but he uh, was saying, hey, you know, this study, you gotta be objective and be critical, this study is no good, basically is what he was saying. And he says the big difference between those two studies, they're basically the same kind, right? The peacekeeping and the, they're both treatment causal effect type things, gun laws versus uh, um, peacekeeping forces. But he said that the peacekeeping study was strong because it was focused. It was a focused study, basically, you know, one outcome they were looking at and and they were able to, they were able to correct for pre-treatment differences where he says in the gun law case, there was just too many, uh, too many things and they didn't have the right data to really Correct. It may not even be possible because only 50 states it may not be possible to really correct for pre-treatment differences in the 50 states are just so different, right? In many different ways. So that's that. That was I thought that was interesting. So again, this is something just as a teaser, I guess, maybe in some sense, right? That's the kind of impression I got anyway. A very different book. And then he talks I mean, about this in terms of like just in terms. Sorry, sorry. This is just a very different book from the other. No, no, please. It's um, it's obviously um, you know, yeah, way more conceptual. You know, and I mean, for obvious reasons, um, but yeah, no, I was just, sorry. Yeah. No, I mean, you look at the, I mean, you look through, you go like this with the book and you see, wow, there's a lot of text in here, right? It's a lot, a lot more, lot I would say it, it, it's, too. it seems a lot more readable, you know, just from a, you know, sort of, yeah. not, it's, I mean, it's obviously less math and, you know, I, I, yeah, that is, I'm excited. Yeah, it sounds really Yeah, cool. yeah it's going to be good. So he talks about this statistical analysis cycle, which makes sense to me. Like, okay, you start out, you well, really you start out kind of with the data, and you maybe plot and do some exploratory stuff. But then you like, okay, here's my model, build up a model, right? And I'm using this. This is actually an equation from Bayes' rules, the Bayes' rules book for the regression chapter. But um, you build some kind of model, you fit it with R stand arm, or you just you know, and you also have to do some other manipulation with your data with tidy maybe or whatever your tools are. Then you try to understand it with plots, with tables, right? And then you want to look at it, say, well, this all makes sense. And you get, then you got to be critical on your data. And okay, um, you know, am I fooling myself some way? If I, am I doing some backdoor p hacking here, what, what's going on here, right? And then you adjust your models, you go around the cycle. And he said the challenge here, this, again, this chapter of challenges, is to be critical of your data without like being nihilistic, you know, just like, ah, this is all garbage, you know. <laughs> Right, not just self-destructing because you keep finding problems with your data. You're always going to have problems with what you're saying. So no study is perfect, and the important thing here is to recognize those challenges and, and try to adjust for them, or address address them in some way. Just real quick, I, I, do, was I did actually read that chapter, and I do remember um, I was working for Cleveland Clinic at the time, and I remember talking about with my co my my colleague saying that point about you know um, you know not going you know to not going to pieces because of all the problems with your data that, that's like at, at, especially when you're doing like observational research with like you know ehr data set which is what i used to do like that's a big part of your job is not going to piece you know you know it's it's actually kind of an underrated part <laughs> is that right a biostatist i mean i don't know about other fields but you know we have messy data in you know hospitals you know systems for example right like things get missing or they you know they don't 
They don't populate, you know, some people have a BMI of 4,000 for some reason. Why is that? I don't know. You know, it's like, there's all kinds of, yeah. I mean, it's a sort of, sort of an interesting point is like a lot, it's a, it's a lot more of your job sometimes than we realize is, you know, not going to pieces, trying to figure out the best way to serve imperfect data, I guess is what I'm, maybe that's what I'm trying to say. Not, not very well, but that's what I'm getting to, I guess. But, yeah, that's a great, that's, no, that's a really good insight. I mean, I would give you one other insight on that too, that I came from a physics background and I think, oh, now sure. we've got everything is perfectly controlled. You know, I know the laser frequencies and everything else and I'm mm -hmm. doing my experiment. It's still the case. It's very easy to be overly critical and nihilistic with your data. I remember at one point in my, doing my PhD going this, you know, I got this problem I don't understand with this magnetic field and this, and I got, you know, and then, but in the end, you just have to like, okay, just confess <laughs> when you do, when you finally get ready to publish, you just think, you know, confess it all. Here it is. Here's the truth. Here's some things we didn't understand. Yeah. And here's how we accounted for them. And here's how we accounted for that. And or we attempted to account for this, bi this uh, bias or whatever. Systematic, yeah. systematic errors is the big problem always in physics, right? Systematic errors, always trying to understand those. Sure. Yeah. Because they look, they look like signal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. 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 I'm yeah. just trying to. Sure. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 you're fine. I think in general, the data are messy, or yeah, data are, uh, right? Yes. Data are messy, regardless of the field. So unless you're working with the most perfect machine that is like really, you know, taking into account every measure, millimeter and stuff. Otherwise, because I work with, I'm an ecologist, I work with wildlife. So that's the messiest of the messiest that you can possibly imagine. Oh, Maybe sure. human human data is worse, but um, yeah. no, it's it's really really messy. So I think it's more like what you said. Just know that your data is gonna be messy, or your data are gonna be messy. So you have to sort of um, enter the analysis knowing that, so that you can start with cleaning data and sort of like polishing things here and there and not just think it's gonna be great, right? So your scripts, your code is gonna, you're gonna spend a lot of time doing that. You know what I mean? So so that's, um, so that's yeah, data cleaning is is no joke and it's- Yeah. But it's you said you're a ecologist? You said you're a- it, you, Ecologist, yeah. Ecologist, ecologist. sorry, you call it, sorry, I didn't mean to say oncology. Well, so what kind of data did you say you work with? Wildlife, so I-, oh, cool. I yeah, camera trap data mostly, but all kinds of, of data that you can collect from animals and wildlife. That's so cool. I, uh, I, well, I, 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 my background is in psychology at UC Davis, and they had a big like animal behavior program yeah. that, where, where a lot of people, I actually like ecology has such a cool uh, history of like doing like stuff with like mixed models and like, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, because yeah. exactly. it's like, because we have all this, best. yeah, yeah, it's actually, um, I read, um, I mean, it's not for the the content, but, uh, the, the the domain knowledge, but yeah, just seeing the way y'all deal with um, random effects and mm -hmm. yeah, I mean it's um, yeah, it's actually super super useful. Yeah, 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 it's it's a lot. And so adding that to this cycle, mm -hmm. I something I learned from my from my PhD advisor is that all the analysis and all the model building and all of that is perfect. But that needs to come before, and it probably you already know this, right? But you have to start thinking about these things before you go and collect your data because your study design, your experiment yeah. needs to take this into account. So for example, the, the, the biggest one I see is when you're doing, and I mentioned it here in this chapter, when you're looking into um, interactions between, uh, between treatments, or interactions between covariates in general, you have to design your experiment or, or your um, data collection to account for that interaction. You can't just say, after the fact that you just collected everything and just say, oh, well, let me see if there's an interaction. No, because if you didn't take that into account with putting your, um, your blocks and your random treatments, then you're really not gonna be able to observe that. So I think, I think that I, I I think there's a chapter on that too, but but that's always um, for me at least key to understand De design your experiment design, experimental design, and data collection. Yeah, yeah. Just wanted to add that. Yeah. yeah. I feel like that might be a big part of chapter two, already. Oh. About the yeah, getting understanding your data and not sure about that, but 
Yeah. They haven't read it yet. <laughs> yeah. Cool. That was good insights from you guys. I appreciate that. So next, uh, he talks a little bit about, by the way, I haven't, I'm not talking about everything that's in the chapter. I'm just talking about things I thought were interesting or I thought I wanted to re remember <laughs> right from this chapter. Uh, there's a lot more in that chapter than what I'm talking about. But one of the things he talks about is this Bayesian classical thing. But since you guys are doing Bayes rules, you, you're pretty familiar with this. But, but I do want to just talk a little bit about what his take on it is. His take is, look, there's two primary approaches to interpreting predictions and estimates. One of them is the classical approach, which we're probably familiar with from uh, statistical learning methods, right? And that traditional approach focuses on summarizing the data, right? This is the frequentist type idea, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, unbiased estimators and coverage, you know, 95% of the time, if I were to, you know, sampling distributions, 95% of the times if I were to do this experiment, um, I would expect my true parameter to be within this range, right? Or I guess what they actually say, it's more like if the same statistical procedures apply to, you know, many, many different times, even different problems, I expect it to be, you know, coverage of 95%. Um, I did look ahead and that is something he does talk a little bit more about later in the book, this whole coverage issue. So if that doesn't totally ring a bell for you, uh, it, will be, it will come back later. Uh, so he says the strength of the classical approach is it emphasizes objectivity because the data, there's no, you don't bring any prior information into this, like, or I shouldn't say don't bring anybody, you de-emphasize prior information and try to let the data speak for itself, you're just summarizing the data. And he said, this is fine, but there's a, you know, there's a d difficulty with this when you have small studies or indirect or highly variable data, in which case the Bayesian approach is stronger because you can now bring in this prior information uh, to make up for that in some sense. And so you can make some kind of valid predictions with that weak data. Um, and you'll, you, uh, you know, you guys will learn more. I mean, I don't know where you, how far you're in on the Bayes rule book, Gabby, but you'll see this come through in that Bayes rule book, um, mm -hmm. pretty, pretty, pretty well, how that actually works. And I think in this book too, as well, in later chapters, he's good. I think, oh, chapter nine, little blue text on the bottom. He's going to talk more about how you incorporate prior information to the Bayesian approach to chapter nine. He says one interesting thing, though, he says the practical uh, advantage of the Bayesian approach is you get these random simulations, these posterior draws that you can use to do your inferences with, which is very, very uh, um, handy, I guess I would say. It makes things a little more intuitive how to compute different statistical summaries of the posterior when you have these random yeah. simulations. And one of the things that drew me to this book is that in several places in here, he relies a lot on simulations and to, the authors feel like simulations, fake data, it's very important to uh, to understand your, your methods and what you're doing. And I, the, the bumper sticker he gives or the model he gives somewhere in, I, in the book is fake data as a way of life. That's one of the section headings, which like which is drew me into this book for sure. When I was thumbing through I'm like, yeah, that's right. Fake data as a way of life. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so, so different. That's so different than like, say, 20 years ago, like this idea that you would simulate data yeah. as a way of improving your confidence in your model um, seems, cr I mean, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but like I, very few people would have been like, that's a good idea. But now everyone's like, you know, simulation and all these yeah. different things. It's it's such a test and versus, you know, training sets and all these different ways of improving your sort of confidence in your inference. It's like everything's on the table. I love it. Yeah, yeah. So he says there really is no, he's not an advocate for Bayesian or classical. He kind of says there's really no correct answer. You just be aware of your options. Uh, but he does note that you can use Bayesian methods using Stan uh, GLM, for example, um, with non-informative and weakly informative priors, which you can get similar results you would get from the classical method, but you still get these simulation draws to use for your simulation type thing. So that's what he, um, so he's going to mostly use that method, the Stan GLM. Yeah, he uses Stan GLM, not our Stan arm, which um, hmm. I'm not sure. I just I just now realized that, so I have to look at what the with why he chose that versus the other. But um, any event, that's what he'll use almost almost entirely through this book, I think. In fact, he gives a quick example, like, okay, how do you do that? It is pretty straightforward, right? If you don't if you if you're not going to give any prior, you're going to use their default uh, weak uh, the informative priors. You don't have to give any priors at all. You just it's as if you're just doing it's the same thing as if you did it with LM. You're just using Stan GLM, you know, 
and that's it. <laughs> that's that's the whole thing. Or this could be R scan arm, by the way. I think um, they both can they both give default non informative priors or weekly informative priors, I should say. Hmm. But now, now I have to look that up because I'm confused. Conf wonder why there's what the difference is and advantages one versus the other is. I'm making a note. I'm making a note here. So uh, anyway, the results will be very similar. I just use that vote uh, versus, versus growth thing. And it's like, here's the fit for vote. Here's the fit here, right? The intercept's 46.2 plus or minus 1.6. The growth is 3.1 plus or minus 0.7, the slope there. And then do the same thing with LM. And it's very similar, right? 46.3 plus or minus 1.7, 3.1 plus or minus 0.8. So it doesn't, it's, you know, it's frequentist, Bayesian. Uh, with weak priors, it doesn't really change things too much here. And as just for any Python users out there, they can do the same thing. I didn't actually execute this code, but that's how you would do it. I don't have my reticulate functioning correctly on this machine, but um, that's how you would do it with, uh, with Python if you wanted to. Oh, I think so, that's yeah. it. That's all I have. Can you, can you just go that's back? Uh, yeah, there. Okay, so wait, let me see. So where it says coefficient, that's from the LM, right? From the frequentist, um, from the LM analysis. The Oh, yeah, you know, you're right, because that's kind of funny, because I, I use his language here, but then here I, you yeah, know, yeah. So M2 is from the... Uh, from the frequentist, right? The, the built-in base yeah. R LM thing, right? Linear model. Yeah, 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 exactly. And the stand, I don't know where those, um, the Bayesian coefficients. Oh. So yeah, are M1. M1. So it's actually, I didn't, yeah, but M1, I, you're right. I, did, I should have repeated it here. Um, it's from the, like the first slide or here. So here. the, exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's, so then yeah. the M1 is a stand model. I should repeat okay. that. I'm sorry, yes, you, yeah, you, you, you were just you were just going through it too too fast and I was like trying to, you know, my eyes are not the best. Please, yeah, slow me down. So let's <laughs> let's go. <laughs> let's just go back to the um to 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 both of them so I can see sort of like just compare if that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so that's the M2. Okay. This is and M2, that, right? Uh -huh. So that says that the intercept the is forty six, yeah, and the and the slope is three. Okay, and then yeah, what what's the the stand the, one? This is and this is the stand oh, yeah. that one. Yeah, so here forty six and three. Okay, same result basically. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's what I yeah. was. Yeah, and the same standard deviations. The difference yeah, the, here again, like I said, is with this. Yeah. With the stand, you can actually get at the posterior draws and get the full distribution. So I got that. For example, well, I guess we'll see this later, but you'll see it. Ryan's already seen it. You'll see it soon in, in the Bayes rule book if you haven't already. Is that not only do I get like this mean, the standard deviation, and these percentiles, yeah. I can get anything else because I have all these draws, these uh, posterior draws from the uh, posterior distribution of the growth in the sigma. So it's kind of that's yeah. kind of the advantage he was talking about there. You get a lot more. Possible that's inferences sigma. you can make with that. That's and okay. correlation. The, that's a slope. Uh, that's a weird name. Yeah. That's a yeah. That's a weird name for no, sorry, sigma is the error bar. Or sigma is the error, yeah. Sigma is the residual error. This is the slope of growth. I misspoke. No, yeah, growth is the slope. I thought, yeah, so then sigma yeah. is the say that again. What's sigma? The the residual error on the, on the, the fit, residual right? error, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Okay. I don't think even this this one doesn't even go. Uh, yeah, you don't get that. I from, think it's yeah, know. it's down there. Oh, yeah, yeah here that's it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So that's the. This is actually um, a little bit bigger. But yeah. three point seven. No, it's not that big. Oh, sorry, it's not bigger. Smaller. Similar. It's similar within the errors, right? Point, Plus point minus nine. point nine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. No, I'm just trying to um, familiar. But familiar you know these these myself. different. But again, this is just a quick introduction, and he's going to, I think, not for several chapters later, we'll, he's going to dive more into this, um, what these functions do and what they return. This is just kind of like a teaser, I guess, for, you know, just, it's meant to kind of show, look how easy it is. You just plug it in and run and off to the races, right? So, <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, that's basically all I have for this chapter. Um, oh, did, so if you, did you guys look at the exercises at all? 
Uh, did not. The but exercises the so. are very, yeah. So the exercises are, again, they're, because it's a conceptual chapter, they're mostly conceptual exercises and having you like look at some, you know, uh, well, you, you, you're kind of cool, actually. The first one, you, when you read it, you'll see this paper. I didn't do this one because you, this is for a classroom, right? Everybody's supposed to make paper helicopters and take data on the paper helicopters, you know, how wide and how long they are and do a regression. Or do not regression, but do some plots and stuff. And it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I bet that's, but, that yeah. appeals to your physics physics heart yeah it does indeed <laughs> but um i did look at some of the exercises but if you guys didn't maybe we'll just wait and uh we can talk these exercises the are fun. i'm looking at mine for next week it's like i used to teach research methods so i mean a lot of the stuff oh, okay. reliability and validity it's like yeah that's i mean that's fun yeah this is fun okay and by the way so we talked about this before you got here but um the pace, our intention is to do, my intention, I guess, but that's subject to you guys' opinions on this, is to do one chapter a week. But for example, Ryan, you're doing chapter two. If you get into it and you're like, hmm, this needs to be, this needs to be split up into two chapters so I can have some time to play with these exercises, please just you know, mm -hmm. let us know on chat on Slack and then we'll adjust the schedule accordingly. Sounds good. And that goes, of course, for any of these chapters when we get to them. Yeah. Any other questions, concerns mm -hmm. before we... Uh, Release, yeah. release the house. <laughs> I will. Uh, I will be ready, obviously, I'm, next week, and um, yeah, hopefully, we get a few more people. Great, I'm looking forward to it. By the way, I just put something in the chat. I, I you know, like I don't know about y'all, but whenever I start a book like this, I'm always like searching for any kind of GitHub repositories or oh. any kind of, you know. So yeah, I'm sure you probably yeah. Heard, but I put it on. Uh, I put it on the um, Slack page too. But um, there's a cool podcast. It's in the notes too. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Which I'll anyway, push later, but yeah, I'm. I, one of the reasons, I don't know if you all have much experience with Andrew Gilman's. I mean, I I, I, read, I haven't read much of his academic work, but obviously his blog and you know, like I've seen you know talks of his on like YouTube. So yeah, this is actually going to be it's going to be fun. Did you listen to the podcast? Types. I what didn't. Podcast? I just thought there's well, yeah. There's a, if, if you look on the Slack, it's um, I'll uh, hold on. It's just an episode of like there's a Bayesian. Yeah, um, I think it's called Learning Bayesian or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I don't know what happened. I tried to listen to it like a few weeks ago, and I think I got bored. Maybe it was a bad chapter. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, a, I don't know. I was in a weird mood or something. I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, I have trouble with podcasts in general. Yeah, I, uh, it's hard to I focus. Listen, I, I, I've, I've been listening. To, I'm, I'm a big podcast person, but yeah, I know what you mean. I love like, them. I yeah. love them, but... It was a bad chapter meeting. <laughs> yeah. I also like I, I listen to them like I, I speed it up like almost two times fast. That's maybe the secret, yeah. Yeah, because like yeah. then I don't know about you, because it's like if it's if it's you know, well, I guess if it's really complicated, I wouldn't do that, but like like news yeah. and like uh, different things, like yeah, just it's like you get in and you get out. I don't know. That's my that's my personal bias. My mind wanders too far. I know. That's why you gotta go faster because that way you're like, okay, you gotta pay attention, <laughs> otherwise we'll never keep up, you know. But yeah, no, I know. It's um some things are not for everybody. But um yeah, no, I'm excited. This will be fun. Yeah, I signed up for All two right, guys. chapters. Oh, oh good. Yeah, no, no. Just, Excellent. Just that. Yeah. So uh this time or um well, you know what. Next week, we'll see y'all. Mm -hmm. Unless anything else. Awesome. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye. See you next time.